It's about to go down with Mark and Kathy, a live coaching show about dropping ideas. Mark and Kathy coach and have conversations with brilliant idea creators who are reimagining the world through the expression of their words, thoughts, and action. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to It's About to Go Down. I'm Mark Williams. This is my sister, Kathy Armias. And we are so pumped because this has now been the completion of an eighth season. We've been doing for this for eight seasons, a glorious season, sitting here with my sister, Kathy, and speaking with over 80 different amazing people. And for this wrap-up episode, as we do during our uh, during most of our wrap-up episodes, is we want to kind of revisit 10 amazing conversations, talk about what we've heard in terms of what they've been doing with their idea, what we've been doing with their idea, and just having a good time reflecting on some amazing conversations. So we've had everybody from Ian to John, to Mario, to John, to Dan, to Jimbo, to Steve, to Trevor, to Yassine, and to my beautiful and awesome wife, Lauren. So Kathy, let's kick it off. And let's start off with that very first amazing conversation from C from from season eight season eight yeah mark let's go this is awesome i can't even believe it's been eight seasons wow 80 people can we just reflect on that for a second like really it's so easy to say eight seasons but eight we've had 80 amazing people on our show 81 if you count mark brown it's like we have to count mark brown of course like, we gotta count we gotta count. count he's got his own <laughs> special wing in the in the and in the, it's about to go down library oh he, he the longest uh longest recorded episode ever right because i think we have three hour pre-show or something like that <laughs> oh eight, 81 <laughs> people mark this is awesome i'm so i'm so grateful to be doing this with you um in the last couple of days, I've been I've been rewatching all of the episodes, and I just want to tell you that I've just had such a gratitude for you. Like I'm I'm watching and and oh, I'm laughing at the faces you make. I'm I'm like loving our interactions and just how we engage with our guests and just the awesome people that we've had on and the conversations that we've had and and how deep we've went in all these subjects. It's just I don't know. Just wanted to. I wanted to express a little gratitude before we get going. I'm not just going to get into it. <laughs> you know, the love fest is mutual. You know it. So good. So good. Awesome. Well, Mark, you know, it's so cool. So thinking about season eight kicking off, we had Ian Williams. Um, Ian is from Portland. He he left Nike and he started a coffee uh, shop that was built for the community. Uh, it's a sneaker theme shop because Ian is a, he's a sneaker head like no other. And he's a sneaker designer for those of you that don't know. And I don't think we have talked about it on the show, but he designed, um, he started at Nike as a janitor and he ended up designing, um, you know, how those, you, you know, how those, those little signs that say wet floor, like caution, wet floor. Yeah. He designed a sneaker with that yeah. theme, like the yellow and black. So if you look up Ian Williams mm. and you check it out, like, so Ian, Ian is somebody in Portland too, and beyond Portland, of course. Ian is somebody that's doing great things. He's all about community. He's all about connecting people. So it's so cool to have him on the show. And, you know, he's about to give a TED Talk at TEDx Portland on community. So, I mean, all of this was just kind of, yeah, it's just kind of, it was kind of cool that it all kind of came together like this. But, you know, um, I, I love, there was a moment where we had so much fun. Uh, you'll probably remember when Ian was talking about how, you know, he might be throwing socks into the hamper and, and, and he, and he said, you know, you go and the crowd goes wild and <laughs> yeah. And he was like, why you need the, why you need to say the crowd, <laughs> but it was because of people. Yeah. And he said, people uh -huh. need people. So anyway, I don't, it, that was such a, it was such a good episode and, and that's what we got into, right? Community is with you, within you. People need people. Um, yeah. It was awesome. And, 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 and thank you for, for the reminder of throwing the sock into the hamper or the balled up paper into the garbage. Like I'll never have a crowd around me again 
the way <laughs> that Ian kind of put it out. You know, I got to tell you one other thing that really stood out to me about that conversation was a question that he had asked about or that he inspired about how do you frame an idea in a way that people haven't heard it before, right? And I thought that was such a clever thing because we all have a way of saying or, or speaking on a lot of similar mm -hmm. topics. And we don't want anybody to be like, eh, I've heard that before. Eh, right. I know that. So, you know, I love the genius of that, that yeah. question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause he was saying, you know, what does it take to get people to come to something like to come to an event or whatever? And I remember that he said also, like, you have to think in the mind, you have to kind of think for them, like, you know, get into their minds and think about what they would like. And so, yeah, I, I love that too. I mean, I feel like, I feel like that was such a fun episode for us because that's what we do all the time. We're always like, that's what our whole show is based on. How do you help people say something in a way that's different than how other people are saying it? So, yeah, I love yeah. that. And just as a funny note, I'm going to say, okay, you know, if, if you haven't already heard it on the show, I got bit by a pit bull and I'm pretty scared of dogs. And so I thought it was hilarious that we went on a little rant about Ian and I for a little while about, about not liking dogs. And he goes, I don't hate dog. I don't hate dogs. I just don't love dogs. <laughs> and that's kind of a big no, no in Portland. And then that's what we were talking about for a second. We're like, I don't know. Portland's maybe not the place for you if you don't love dogs. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> had to add that in there, Ian. I and love and that. yet there's a place, I got to tell you, and yet there's a place in every community for somebody um, to join that community. And that's why I loved about that people need people, right? Like no matter what. Yeah. And, and you don't have to, yeah, and, and you can just look for, there, there's so many communities out there. Like you never have to feel alone. So Awesome, awesome. My my yeah. my brother from another mother, because we share the same surname, Mr. Ian. Yeah, Willis. you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, I gotta tell you, there's a combination of names as well because yes, we, we've is. thrown a couple of Johns in this season eight. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> you know? And and I appreciated the conversation with John McSherry. John is doing some amazing work in the area of real estate and in base investment. I mean, he's finding places that people might not see any value in and he's remodeling and refixing and reinventing spaces. And he's going out and he's meeting some incredible people. He's doing big things. I could not be more proud of him. But what makes me so proud of him is the story that he shared you know, about, you know, his struggles, his own personal struggles and how he has overcome them. And, and I love that, that it started off with, how do you use your pain to power your success? Mm. And then he came up with this whole idea of, or our conversation led to this whole idea of asset-based yes. thinking, right? Yes. I love how he asked this question. Oh. Are you living life like a liability? Oh, or an asset. That was oh. my favorite. I know. I was like, oh, I I still remember that, Mark. I think about that conversation a lot because it's like, do you remember when he said that he bought his, like he went to live with his aunt and like his aunt had kind of helped him get a fresh start. And then, and then he was like, oh, I saved up all this money to get the first property that he was getting. And it was a house or a condo or something. And, and he goes, and then he went, you know, then he went to the seminar. Um, and, and the first thing that he realized was that he bought the wrong kind of property. He should have been mm -hmm. buying property that was making him money. And, and that was a very poor choice for the first property. And so he was like, I literally just found out I bought a liability. And I, I won't forget that because then we kind of veered it towards, are you living like a liability or an asset? Oh, so good. Yeah. And, 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 and here's the, and I'm going to use this word intentionally. Here's the beauty behind that. When he spoke about liabilities and assets, there was also this understanding of you have to see the beauty in all things. And sometimes that's hard. And things, matter of fact, the way he, I had to write this yeah. one down. We are all beautiful 
It's the belief that we are not that is the problem. Oh, so good. Oh. Go ahead, John. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, come on, John. Well, it was it was awesome to watch, you know, him unpack his whole journey and to even be vulnerable enough to start with, you know, the low time and and to go into that space. And and at the end, I love um how you mark how you kind of applauded him and said, well, an asset that John brings to this world is his his ability to build not only not only in the real estate but you said also building relationships and so that that was cool so yeah that was a, that was a that was a really good he could definitely give a TED talk on that for sure are you a liability oh, or you an asset he definitely should he could give Maybe. a TED talk on a bunch of things but that he should definitely do a TED oh, talk on for sure I'm not, I'm not have to uh, call him up. I'm going to have to call John up. John, you can call him up and be like, hey, we, we're talking about, we're still talking about your idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that one was really great. And you know, uh, episode number three was our friend, Maria Lewis. Oh, now I want to, I'm so glad I'm introducing this one, Mark, because, you know, I even introduced that episode by saying what you're looking at is two competitors that compete against each other almost every year. But what you're also looking at is two friends. Yeah, right? Two brothers, two friends. And I love that about you. There, I can't think of any other people in any other district or competing that much against each other that have also come together to help each other out so much. Like you and Mario and even Brian, you know, Brian Robinson. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, one of the conversations that I remember having with Mario one year when we were competing is we're sitting there and we just finished the contest briefing and now we're ready to go out into the room and names be called and stepping on stages. And the last thing that we said to each other was, let's go out there and change some lives. Right? And that's I what got, it was about. I got it wasn't you. about competing. Yeah, oh. so I, I love this brother. I love this brother. I love this brother like I love my sister. And what I enjoyed about this conversation was us delving into the creative process, right? Because we all have our own twist on a creative process. Yep. And it wasn't pitting the, the process against each other. It was like, let's bring all of these different creative aspects together and let's just like create one huge library, one huge, what did he say? Um, a diversity of creativity. Oh my gosh. So good, right? A diversity of creativity. I love that too, Mark, because, and you know, I have to say, I don't know if this happened for you, but you know, at the end we had this challenge. We, we all decided to take the Freaky Friday challenge. <laughs> I'm going to be Mark Williams for a day and do it. Remember, it was like you two switching and do it the way Mark Williams would do it. And I'm going to do it the way Mario Lewis would do it. But, um, you know, one thing that really kind of started to affect me is when I coach people, I usually have them do it my way. And most people love that. They're like, oh, I don't have to write a script. Oh, thank God. You know, but then what it made me realize too, is I start to ask more questions now. I'm like, do you write a lot? Is writing your process? Because remember how he just talked? He's like, I watch, I watch, I watch, I watch. I consume, 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 you know, comedy, this, that, speeches. And then he's like, and then I write, I write, I write, I write, I write, I write. <laughs> and then I try to test and test and test and test. And so I love that. He had a very defined, he had a very defined system and it works for him. And so now I, I feel like what, one of the things I want to ask at first is I don't want to force you into my system. Let's figure out what, let's figure out the best system for you. Cause then if also, if you're a Mark Williams, I remember I, I was making fun of you on the show. I was like, yeah, we had all these changes for Mark. He wakes up at five o'clock in the morning, the next morning does them. And by the time he talks to us the next day, hundred percent changed. And we're all like, how did you do that? <laughs> and you said, that's just part of my process. So anyway, going. You know, I love the fact that you talked about how you incorporate that, incorporating this into coaching sessions, because I often think, and I'm going to put my teacher hat on for a moment. We always think about different ways that students learn mm -hmm. and acknowledging that there are a diversity of creative processes. It's like talking to the clients that I work with and saying like, 
you have this option or you can go this way, or you can go that way. You know, what works best for you or for ourselves and for them? You know, creativity, we talk about this writer's block or speaker's block, right? Or creativity block. And sometimes the process that you always use, it's not clicking for you, you right. know? So maybe my Jay-Z Little Wayne method is not clicking for me today. So maybe today I want to use my idea of not. Or maybe I want to go full Mario Lewis route and pick up my pen and the, actually start writing everything The Bon out Jovi. <laughs> Oh, the Bon Jovi <laughs> method? Because <laughs> that's what you called it on the show, right? Yeah. I love that, Mark. And maybe, maybe too, maybe here's the thing. I, you just touched on something that, that I, you know, not for us to go down this rabbit hole too much, but you touched on something that I think is really important is like maybe our job as the coach is to help them determine what's the best is not maybe because maybe they, they're like, oh, I have a process, but it's not working right now. And then we go, oh, okay. I can help you fix that by doing this. So sometimes people do completely rely on us to go, ah, oh, my method is horrible. I just, ha, ah, it's terrible. I try to write and then, and then, and then I feel stuck to the word and I'm the, you know, so I think what he taught me though, is to dig deeper and, and look for the diversity of, of creativity. I love that. Oh, that was a good yeah. one. That was a good one. Was well, good. I tell you, I, I, he challenged us. Well, we challenge each other to experiment with the other different processes. And, and I've delved into that a little bit. And that actually reminds me of the challenge that the other John that we spoke to this season set up. And 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 Kathy, I gotta oh. I gotta hang my head low. I gotta hang my head low. John Lund, Mr. Excitement himself, Mr. Wife Carrying Champion himself, Mr. Killing mosquitoes, Mister. Sitting in a hot sauna. <laughs> I mean, this dude is crazy. Oh, oh my gosh! And he you loves know, it. <laughs> he loves it. He loves doing things. I love the way he said this. He loves doing things that other people would say, hey, "Now that's a terrible idea." Yeah. But shouldn't we all, right? We should yeah. all try something that somebody would consider to be a terrible idea. And I remember by the end of that conversation, we were playing one of those famous Kathy games. And I said that I would do the polar plunge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I will tell you, I did look it up. I will <laughs> tell you that I looked up how to sign up. I will tell you that I couldn't figure out how to sign up, which might be a Freudian slip for, I didn't look deep enough. Right, right. <laughs> and I have to admit, I did not do the polar plunge like I said I would. So even though I don't like cold water, it is the month of March, which means there are still 10 months for me to figure out how to commit to doing a polar plunge in January. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that in January 1st, 2025, the weather will be just as warm as it was on January 1st, 2024. <laughs> well, you better not hope put a hope on that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no. That's not a normal, that's not a normal New York thing. Well, you're right. You have the, you know, no, John, it's not. John, John will forgive you for it. And, and you should definitely try to make it happen because then it may, it makes us live a little bit of the life of John Lund. Um, I said that mm -hmm. I would do, um, I would try to do stand up comedy on a stage. That's, oh, that meant like that, that there's not a lot of things, Mark, that get me like, woo. that gets me like, woo. But you know my my favorite. Well, there was two parts I really loved from the from this episode. One of them was this one thing that I he really did a good job of saying, don't don't get to the end of your life and have regrets. And and the one story that he pointed to I loved because he pointed to that story where he was in law school, and you know there was two routes you could take a finance class or an entertainment law, yeah. And, and he, and everybody was like, oh, if you take the entertainment law one, people might not hire you at their firm. Cause that's just kind of like, like, that's not serious law or whatever. You should take the finance one. 
And so he kind of caved and he took it and he always regretted that he didn't because he was really interested in it, which is very interesting. And so he, he kind of gave us that thing of like, make sure whatever you do, you don't regret. And I love also the last thing that I asked him, I said, so what did you, what did you take away from what we said? And I never expected this, but he said, you guys have made me realize that I need to do more things. <laughs> I was like, that's what she got out of our conversation. Mark and I were thinking that we did, we don't do enough things, but you were thinking you need to do more. Okay. Okay. All right. He just has a different uh, brain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's something powerful in that conversation because I feel like as people in general, I'm not going to just say speakers, but as people in general, I think we often think about how do we convince other people to do things? Like, how do you convince somebody to do something? Mm -hmm. And what I appreciate about that conversation and a point you brought up about law school is how do you convince yourself mm -hmm. to do something yeah. unconventional, right? Because that's yeah. often the biggest struggle of them all. And John is the king of convincing himself to do some unconventional things. <laughs> oh my gosh maybe that's where it stemmed from mark maybe he was like i am never gonna miss another entertainment law you know <laughs> class again so i'm gonna i'm gonna do a wife carrying contest i'm gonna do a mosquito killing contest i'm gonna do a hot sauna con like and then live in finland i mean his journey has been amazing oh and then become a professional wrestler in and his 30s like <laughs> Ah, oh, the list goes on. I'm sure since we've talked to him, he's done other major things that we don't know about yes. right now. Yes. Like that, that guy is an interesting guy, but what a cool, what a cool guy. He's, he's very cool. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. That's very awesome. Well, you know, the next, our, our next guest, Dan Strum, right? Mm -hmm. Dan, he, um, <laughs> I remember when you first introduced Dan to me, and you're like, oh, he's got this thing called the Fight Club. And I, and I immediately thought about the movie. I thought about, or I thought about dog fighting, or I, I was like, what is the Fight Club? I had no idea that it was helping people piece together speeches. <laughs> mm. but, but what a cool idea. I mean, it. I found it very fascinating that, you know, he's in the cybersecurity area and he he, it kind of stemmed from this story where a bunch of people got into a room, um, all cybersecurity people trying to figure out different frauds that have happened in different places. And then they started coming together and going, oh, well, this IP address showed up here. And then this showed up here and here. And then didn't he said they walked out of the room with like, I mean, they walked out of the room with like a na an actual name, an address. Like they had, pe they had played detective via their fight club, right? and um pieced it together so yeah that was the concept super interesting very interesting and, and as i shared on the show i i went to a, a live fight club and yeah. it was an awesome experience and i've been i've told dan this i've incorporated aspects of the fight club into coaching sessions um because i i just think it's a great way to brainstorm especially on the uh, on the spot you know, so I think you can come up with some great stuff and it, it, it's a really great idea. What stands out to me about that conversation, two things stand out to me. One, when he said he's trying to take the individuality out of public speaking. Love that, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the worst part about public speaking is you feel like you're doing it all alone. So I love that. Mm -hmm. But what I also loved about that conversation was this sort of, how do you come up with a name for something? Yeah. And yeah. I just want to sit on that for a moment because, you know, I, I always say all hail the queen. I say you are the queen of concepts, but I think you are also so super creative and genius with coming up with names for things. And I'm just wondering if we could revisit that conversation and just even thinking now, mm. how do you, how do you come up? With, with some of these great names for workshops, for book titles, for, because you're good at this, Kathy. You're really good at this. Thank you, Mark. You know, I, 
I, I think I have to fight against this a lot with, with people who don't think that they're creative. Cause a lot of people will say that, right. Oh, I'm not creative. You're really creative, Kathy. I just think I flex the muscle more than people. I try things. I'm, I'm not afraid to, Oh, what about this concept? What about, I spend a lot of my life doing that. And so I, I don't, I just think it comes from practicing. Uh, it comes also from the thing, you know, well, the reason why we started our speaker skills Academy, right. Is that the art of drilling is the art of practicing something. And it's more than doing it in the moment. If you put me on the spot and you're like, Oh, my friend, Kathy can come up with a million I a dollar idea. I'll probably freeze up and never come up with it. <laughs> I'll be like, Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> what? No, but because we drill, remember this, we did this session the other day with Speaker Skills Academy on the, on the um, stacking stories. So we were teaching everybody why they should gather their stories. And don't, don't you see the value in that mark is like, it's like, I do that with concepts as well. I'm constantly creating concepts and then writing them down. And so I just, it's just the art of, it's the art of practicing. It's the art of drilling on that. That's what I would say. That's beautifully said. That's beautifully said. I think about in, in my experience where people are like, oh, we need somebody to go speak for a few moments. Ask Mark to do it. And it's like, yeah, but it's not because I have some magical thing, right? It's just because I've figured out how to exercise the muscle. So I love that you said that. The reason why you are able to so amazingly come up with great titles and great concepts is because you exercise the muscle. We've all got the muscle. We just have to exercise it. So I love that, that, that we shared that. And I know we came up with a couple other names that Dan yeah. can use. I know fight club is, is, is near and dear to his heart. And what stands out to me about that is something you said that behind any great title is a great story yeah and he yeah. has a great story for why he, he calls it fight club just like we got a great story for why this show is called it's about to go down <laughs> oh we totally do we do oh my god yes. oh. funny funny story um you know, in prep for us to do this today, I go back and watch all the episodes and, and John wanted to watch some of the episodes with me and he go, he starts, so he types it in so we can watch it on the TV he types in, it's about to go down. And Kevin Hart comes on and the clip comes on where Kevin Hart <clears throat> says, I, I took a deep breath. I looked at my friends and I said, it's about to go down. He had never seen it before. And so, yeah, he had never seen it, before, which is crazy. I'm like, I'm in the bathroom brushing my teeth and I'm like saying the words. I'm like, I know that, that, that like, right? Like, I'm just... <laughs> and, and I, it was very fun to watch his reaction to it, to see it. And I was like, yeah, mm. this is Mark and I all the time. Like, oh, Mark, it's about to go down. Mark, and then Mark's like, it's about to go down. So, right, we have a good story. And, and you're right, every time somebody hears our the name of our show, it it hits them and like oh that's a good name why do you guys call it that <laughs> it is and can I can I piggyback off of that I, I will tell you as on different coasts almost worlds apart I will send Kathy I will send you a text about something that's about to come up and I almost feel like I'm not truly ready yet to go up in front of that group. Until I get a response back from you. It's like the, the world's just connecting. Uh, <laughs> it's about to go down. <laughs> he's like, all right, I can go on stage now because I'll write you back and I'll be like, <laughs> so excited. <laughs> and I'll, I'll send you the other <laughs> meme. Yeah, I know. Same, same, Mark. There's oh, something dude. there's something that um, you know, there's something that we've created that is kind of our tradition. And that's what I love about Dan's thing too. It does feel near and dear to his heart. The only issue he has in branding is that people already have something else very much attached to that. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. but it's a good concept and I love, I loved it. Yeah. Well, I think he could, um, he would probably love having a conversation with our guest from, from episode six, Jimbo Clark. 
And I know yeah. that Jimbo wasn't just talking about thinking outside of the box for creative ideas. He was talking about thinking outside of the box to change the world. And, you know, I didn't bring it down with me, but he kept yeah. his promise. I went down to the mailbox and I opened, I was like, wait, wait. And then I remembered as soon as I was like, look at this box. And then of course I went to the dinner table with the family and I put it on. And at first they were like, uh, what is that? What are you doing? <laughs> oh, you're oh, a dinner table man, conversation. But this, was, <laughs> but this was a great conversation. And, and I love the fact that he was looking for a new idea around presenting this whole idea of thinking outside of the box. And the fact that he actually created boxes and yeah. then he spoke about how, you know, we all want to see change in the world, mm. but how about we change what's inside of our own box first? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, okay. Um, I actually wrote the quote down because I this is word for word mm. what he said because I loved it. I mean, I, th th I was like, oh, I want to verbatim say this. Thinking about mm. changing the world. And remember, we had this whole thing about the, the world, right? So ch thinking about changing the world is overwhelming, but changing your world by changing your own inner thinking is how you can create. And then he said, you can create new behaviors, new actions. And then when you change your own world, you could affect the world, the world around you. Like, whoa. That was powerful. <laughs> That's so that powerful. Was, yeah, yeah. I tell you what else, um, in, in addition to that, what I feel like reinforced that is when he said something to the effect of change is risky because change takes you away from what is safe. Yeah. And I yes. That was so wow. 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 He really hit that on the head. But I don't know if you remember this, Kathy, and I'm sure you did because you watched all the episodes over again. He was struggling with, mm -hmm. or we were having a conversation with how to how to speak about this idea. And and when we started talking about how do you apply this to everyday examples. That really stood out to me because I think um, a lot of people, when they're sharing their ideas, it's almost like you want to think of the best, the most, the greatest way, the biggest way to implement right. your idea. And sometimes it's those everyday small occurrences that are the great demonstration of an idea that you have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing about Jimbo, um, and I'm sure you're starting to understand this, Mark. Jimbo, Jimbo's one of those really rare, like, you know how I was saying earlier, like, oh, you just got to flex your muscle and anybody can be creative. No doubt. Jimbo is a special, Jimbo's a special level. Like he really, his brain. And, you know, I think maybe he even described it at the end. Cause remember he said he was kind of diagnosed, adult diagnosed as ADHD. And now he understands some of the things he said, like, I'll go on, you know, motorcycle rides for three hours by myself. And that makes sense mm -hmm. to me as a creative as well, how his brain is so intricately connected to other things. And so I, it makes sense to me, but, but he is so creative, but so to, to hear him say, like, at the end too, where he was like, oh, I don't like, when we were asking him, which one, which idea would you talk about? And he's like, ooh, I don't know if I'd want to talk about the personal idea. That really, that was really, that was a really interesting moment, um, I think for Jimbo. It's like, he's so used to like, comes up with ideas and people love his ideas. And then he's like, ooh, this one's connected to me. And so that was very vulnerable of him. And you know, Jimbo's, Jimbo's a good guy. He's got great perspective. The guy's been married um, to a beautiful Taiwanese woman, Anita, mm -hmm. who's hilarious. Their family is so cute. And he's been living in Taiwan for, I think, I think he's coming up on 30 years now. It was like 28 years, 30 years, something like that. Like his perspective is, is awesome. His ideas don't just stem from where he's at. Like he's got a really good perspective. So yeah, it was very fun. I loved having this episode with him. Yeah. Well, can I just jump in and say this also? You mentioned how vulnerable he, he is. And then I thought about another V word that came up and it was visceral. 
And um, I know yeah. in this day and age, we talk about being interactive, right? Can you do an interactive workshop? Can you have an interactive meeting? Can you do an interactive presentation? But we didn't use that word interactive. It was visceral. Yeah. How do you make your, your the experience visceral? Yeah. And um, that really got me to thinking like, what well, what can you do to get people moving and and just experiencing that whole. So again, putting the box on my head at the dinner table, that was a visceral moment. I <laughs> oh my God, I bet. We still have to jump on the call. Jimbo, if you're out there watching, we still need to hop on a call and I'll grab one of my the boxes that he left with me as well. Because we got to actually do the whole training with him where you draw yes. the things on the inside and the outside and you open flaps and and then and then you'll have your like, art version of your of your box mark and then you can take a picture and then send it to him so yeah that was a great episode i love thank you for bringing up the word visceral you're right i i you know th that was a that was something that came up and i love how unique that word was that 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 experience for us was very visceral it was awesome Awesome. Yeah, well, it, it was kind of fun to go from Jimbo Clark to Steve Brown. Like, whoo! <laughs> it, uh, like, here, here you have two brilliant men doing two totally different things in life. And Steve Brown, the futurist, right? So Steve Brown, um, the reason I met him, he moved to the United States to become, to work for Intel for a long time. I think like 15, 16 years, something like that. He was a futurist there and then he left and he started his own company and speaking and he wrote um, his own book and he was on talking about AI and all the things that are, that are, that are out now and, and things and he get, he painted us a, a future of maybe he painted us a future of like five years from now, but he painted us a future of maybe like sometime in our lifetime that was wild, right? Yeah. Yeah, oh. this is, I got to tell you, ever since that conversation, I found myself not only experimenting more with AI, but repeating something that he said, which was, mm. it's not that AI technology will replace humans, but the humans who are using AI technology will replace those who are not. Yeah. And I love that. And I and I also love how he talked about with that in mind, what we need to do is double down on our own humanity. Yeah. 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 I like that. I like yeah, that. Yeah, I love that. Yep. Yeah. Um, another thing that he said that I thought was pretty I it would just like made me be more aware. He's like, you know, AI is going to do a lot of really great things. And and, and I think people want to fall. He's like, I'm not going to fall in that Terminator camp. Remember, he kind of talked about the Terminator and, you know, I'm not, I'm just not going to fall into that camp. He goes, yeah, with, with the, with the technology, the, the bad actors will also rise to the top. And he kind of talked about people being able to like call your mom or your grandma and be, you, you know, be duping your voice and asking for money. And so th there's technology will also increase but, you know, it's, he really kind of warned against allowing us to go into that space of like, oh my God, it's going to be Terminator. And that, I think that's what really leads up to that, that saying, because Yassin said it too, actually. He said that it's kind of funny that they had the same quote, mm -hmm. AI is not going to replace people. It's going to replace the people. It only replaces the humans that don't use it. And, and so, I don't know, Steve just really encouraged us to look at, Look at the things that we enjoyed in life too, because we in our lifetime we might have we might come to a place where we could have AI duplicates of ourselves or you know an AI version of ourselves. Was so interesting to think about um, doing things for us. So what would we do with our lives if we had more free time? Yeah, I don't know. That was that just really that, and that's the that's the human part. You know, what would you do? Yeah, well, I tell you what we could do. We could have an AI version of Kathy and Moore doing it's about to go down in every country, in every language, oh. while we're just sitting on the beach hanging out with our families. That <laughs> I like that. I'm not mad about that. <laughs> oh I, it no, would be but I gotta ask you this. I gotta ask you this. Mm -hmm. Because 
what that conversation brought up was fear. And sometimes people are afraid to implement something. And I'm sure whether it be AI technology, storytelling, public speaking, like there's yeah. a lot of things that we all talk about that make people very scared. I, I remember having a conversation with my kids about talking and it's like, they brought up what we always hear. People are afraid. Right? And it, mm -hmm. I guess the question I have that I just wanted to bounce around with you for a second is, how do you get people beyond the fear of implementing an idea? Mm. Mm. That's such a good question, Mark. Because different, yeah. I mean, there's probably a general fear that people have with new ideas. Do you remember what he said in the episode two? He said, a lot of people stand to make a lot of money by keeping things the way they are. And I, and I, that's not just for AI, right? That would be, I mean, think back to any technologies that, that transitioned into a new way. There's people that had already invested time, money, resources, and created things. And so there's also this level, there's fear. There's also, you know, there's a lot of things going on there. You know, but one of the things that I think I, for me, and I can't speak for the world, for the world, <laughs> for my world, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, you know, I have to focus on the good and not, and, and not focus on the bad. And so be excited about the things that can be done. Like, can they take AI and, and cure childhood cancer because they can go into the body and, and do something that a regular doctor wouldn't be able to do and be able to read some tests that we really can't do right now. And like, that would be exciting. Like, you know, what, what good can we do? You know, don't. And then there's people in the middle, like people are talking about, I, I hear a lot in our industry, people are like, oh, they're going to like, they're going to write speeches with it or do whatever. And it's like, I mean, people can use it in different ways. You can use it as a thought partner. And that's, uh, that's a way I use kind of AI. Um, right. Or you could use it. In, and if you used it in a way that people could tell you were lazy and you're like, oh, I don't have to write a speech. I'll just have this, you chat GBT, write my whole speech. I mean, it'll be, it'll be obvious, you know? So it is, yeah. it's, it, it's the human piece, right? Doubling down on, on being human. That's what we got to do right now. Well, I love, that's right. I love it when you double down on your humanity, Kat. Yeah, th yeah, same, Mark. <laughs> and I can't wait to see our, I can't wait to see our bots doing our show. That'll, that will really be interesting. And we have enough, you know, with, with 81 episodes right now, we have enough, like there's enough of Mark and Kathy out there that, that AI could probably learn and, and pick up our traits. <laughs> Man, we better be on the lookout. There might be an episode of it's about to go down with Mark and Kathy that's already out there. That's true. <laughs> totally. It could be out there right now. Yeah. <laughs> crazy. That's crazy. Oh, uh, well, I enjoyed that conversation. And you know, I'm thinking about our eighth episode with mm -hmm. someone who, well, you've known him for much longer, especially because he did uh TEDx Portland. I've gotten to know him through the Speaker Skills Academy, and this guy is is so charming. I I, I I'm I'm just loving his presence, his yes. company, and his brotherhood. Trevor Beeman, and let me tell you, if you have not watched this TED Talk, check it out and watch it. He did an awesome job, and I love that he's doing so more and looking for other opportunities, and that's the key key word here because he talked to us about the power of opportunity and you know the area better than I do but he talked about the skate park yeah. um, going there and, right and thinking yeah. about the opportunities that exist in young people but people in general and, and and I really love his heart and one of the lines that he said that that really got me thinking was use your elevator wisely Mm. if you are going to use it oh i love that yeah, well because he that. talked about two sides of the opportunity right the one side is we should be if we are able if we have an elevator and we're able to give an opportunity to people we should be doing it but then i really you know and i 
like we got to give props to Trevor right now about the other side of, of the opportunity. Cause he also said, you don't waste an opportunity. If somebody gives you an opportunity or you got to work hard even sometimes to get that opportunity. And I will say when we started the speaker skills Academy, Trevor came to the kickoff. I don't think he's missed. He signed up. I don't think he's missed one session. Talk about somebody that shows up and some of the vulnerability that he shows in our spaces, in our community, he's like, I want to be better at helping people. I mean, ultimately at the end, that's what he's trying to do is help people with their opportunities. And so he's like literally living what he said, like he shows up, he makes it a priority. He shows up and he really engages in that community, not only for himself, but for other people too. So Trevor, if you're watching major props. Yeah, yeah, because you embody this great line. And Kathy, I, I gotta give you credit. I think you're the one who came up with it. The accountability of an opportunity. Mm. And he is really showing his accountability for an opportunity he has. And so I love that. I, I That's what I was talking about earlier, right? You exercise those muscles so much that you were able to take something that he brought into the conversation and feed it out into a way that that really sticks with people. So thank you for that. And Trevor, mm. thank you for, for 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 that conversation, your TED talk and for your presence. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. He's an Great. awesome guy. He is. He's an awesome guy. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I gotta say one other thing. Uh-huh. And I think this came out of the conversation. I'm looking at my notes. Paint a vivid picture of the future and help your listeners see themselves in that picture. Ooh. That was a tip for anybody out there who wants to communicate that came out of the conversation. Paint mm. a vivid picture of the future and help people see themselves in that picture. Mm. That's powerful. That's that is powerful. very powerful. Very, very powerful. Love yes. it. Yeah. Woo. Good one. <laughs> Such a good one. Okay. Um, and then we switch back over to, I, I love, I love our cadence of like, we're like creativity. And then we go to like, yeah. And then we go to Steve Brown. And so we came to Yassine and he, whoo, talk about a man on fire. Like he is creating um, this company and utilizing AI technology to help people in their career space. And, and the idea that he had that I loved, I mean, we went deep on that for a second. And I, I have to mention, this is so funny. Do you know how hard it was to get an episode with him? We finally had to just be like, let's just get a half an hour. And so that's why we had a really short episode. Not because we, we could talk about career capital with him all day long. Um, cause especially he came up with so many concepts. I love them and we should talk about some of them, but, but man, just thinking about your career capital and thinking about what you put into that and, and, and he's creating a company to help people, um, do better in interviews, to be able to gauge how they, how well they would do in an interview. I mean, he sent us that link Mark and I listened to the, I listened to that demo that he ran for his company dang, that was good. I sent it to my sister who worked for the patent office. I was like, what do you think of this? She was like, wow, <laughs> so good. You know, I didn't tell this story during the episode and you're right. This was like an express episode of it's about to go down. <laughs> it was the quick version. Um, here's what stood out. Here, here's what stands out to me that we didn't get a chance to talk about. I remember working with Yassine when he was a student. Mm. Um, and he spoke about how he had a really hard time standing up in front of a crowd and speaking. And it was almost like he would freeze. And then I remember wow. I just asked him to sit down for a moment and speak. And it was, it was, it was a weird moment because when he actually physically sat down, it was like all of the nerves went away. But and, and 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 by the way, it was he sat down and I sat down, so it was like we were on the same level. Mm. There was no hierarchy of, of body or anything like that, and so it was interesting. And then take it a step further. Several years later, he's telling me about this business idea he's got, and he's struggling with how 
to communicate what it is and what he wants to do. And Kathy, during this Express episode, I mean, he was so fluent. He was so into it. And to your point earlier, he's exercising this muscle. He's going to these hackathons. He's going to all kinds of things. Yep. And he's constantly yep. communicating about his idea. And that's why it's coming out so fluently mm -hmm. now. So it, it's just wonderful to, to see his growth. And I got to give a shout out to this line. Choose your smart friends wisely because mm. doing this alone sucks. <laughs> I remember that. Oh. oh, he had so many great lines. I love, I love too that he said, how sticky is your switch? Like how sticky is your switch, your pivot? That was really good. He also talked about being an M-shaped individual. Do you remember that? Like, yeah, exactly. I do. One of my favorite like, lines. Yeah, because he kind of described about how a lot of people, like their thing will be up here, but then that's all they have. So it's so kind of like a T-shape. He's like, have have those, you, you have all these points, at least these three points that that are your, your uniqueness and you bring to it. And he's really doing that. I mean, that's a lot of what he's doing with the career capital, right? He's, he's capitalizing. He's having people capitalize on that. So it's so good. It, and I, it's so, I'm so glad, Mark, that you talked about how he started because mm. to see him now, oh, so good. Yeah. Amazing. He's awesome. I mean, he's, he's just awesome. crushing it at, at these hackathons and these pitches and stuff. So good. Oh yeah. Super proud of him. Super proud of him. Well, I gotta tell you, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of his M shaped. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of all of the conversations. And I got to tell you what also makes me very proud. What makes me very proud is our 10th guest this season eight, my lovely, beautiful, super awesome, pretty dot discipline. Awesome. Awesome. Kathy's favorite word is awesome. I'm throwing this kick word out. Ass. Awesome. Awesome wife. Yep. My kick ass wife. Your kick ass <laughs> wife. That's a, when I think of Lauren Williams, I think kick ass. That's what I, yes. my, it comes to my mind. Oh, yes. oh um, genuine, authentic, all, beautiful. Oh my God, we should just adjective fest here. Yes, oh. yes, yes. So. And 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 by the way, I I love and I can't wait till we have John on as well, right? Like this whole idea of bringing our spouses on and yeah, and bringing them into the fold. <laughs> That's right. This is awesome. This is awesome. And and I love the vulnerability because. Yeah. I may be speaking, you may be speaking. This is not what Lauren does, but she can get up in front of a room. She's in a she's been an amazing teacher. She knows how to captivate a room. Mm -hmm. um, but this is not necessarily her forte, but she came in and spoke about a topic that is so near and dear to her, um, to us uh, as a couple and as a family. It's in the importance of diversity. Mm -hmm. And I love that she was vulnerable. We, we, here comes that word again, vulnerable to, to speak about her childhood and, yeah. and how she grew up and what was going on in her mind and the conflicts that she was having about her own community while also wanting to show that appreciation for her community. And I love the idea that when you step outside of your community and you expose yourself to so many people who are different, it actually elevates your appreciation for your own identity and community and that that was that was a huge point that was a huge point yeah uh, mark well first of all it wasn't until i was going back and watching all the episodes that i was like did we have no other females on they were all males until we got to lauren i was like <laughs> i I don't know how that cadence happened and what happened because, you know, it's always been a pretty good mix. And and then she comes on and talks about diversity. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, well, we didn't have we didn't have a ton of diversity on 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 that note. No, but but seriously, in all seriousness, like having Lauren on was amazing. She melted me at the beginning, Mark, with how vulnerable she was. I get I, I don't know what it was. I don't know if I wasn't expecting it, but she just fully stepped into this space and she was so kind and so respectful to every community, to every, you know, because she taught she she did something that I thought a lot of people should be 
brave enough to do is to talk about her own feelings and her own experience without making people or a community that she might not feel the same things that they feel, feel bad about what they're feeling. She's expressed that really well, but she was able to say what she was feeling. And I love that. And I, I have to tell you, I just love, and I've personally known about this story. So to have you two like come out and say it in public, but this story about how, you know, you weren't accepted in the family at first. And then, and now Lauren's like, I don't know, my mom probably likes Mark more than me. And, <laughs> and just people having to overcome the barriers of, 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 you know, how they thought or what I just, really beautiful. It's just such a beautiful story. And your guys' family is so, you have such an awesome family unit, the way that you live together and the way that you raise your kids. It's, I just think it's such a great episode for the world because you guys live an exemplary life. Well, I got to tell you, you know, yes, you've known our story and I'm so happy she was vulnerable about it as well. And it's like, the beauty of progress because yeah, our story did start off in a very tough place. And what I've learned about it, even through our conversation is sometimes a coming together of people, and I mean a whole community mm -hmm. can be very difficult because and this point came up during our conversation because you know, listen, we want to be able to preserve our identity and our community. And, and we really understand that. And sometimes what's different is often scary until you realize that what's different is sometimes only based on one aspect of identity. Yeah. And I yeah. love how our conversation brought up that we are all made up of so many different aspects of our community, of, or rather of our identity, right? Yeah. We said if yep. you create a list of a hundred different things, you probably still would not come up with every side of who you are. So getting to know every side of who somebody else is without judgment, which like you said, Lauren did an amazing job oh. with. Ah, yeah, she says she wants to take this conversation on the road. I know. <laughs> I was like, I love this. I, I, you know what, honestly too, I don't, I don't know about on the road. Cause I don't know about, um, that time that we have, but I definitely think that we should, I definitely think that we should do something with this conversation. Like there's something bigger we should be doing with it. And I'm so glad that Lauren, like this isn't her normal space, but she absolutely is a great communicator, speaker, storyteller, expressing her thoughts. Um, it would be really, it would be really fun to elevate this. We should, we, we got to find a way to elevate it somehow. I know yeah, she absolutely. might, I know she might want to choke me out if I say it, maybe, I don't know, maybe not, but <laughs> Lauren, you should give a Ted talk on this. <laughs> <laughs> is she going to choke me out, Mark? Uh, I, I don't know if she, she won't choke you out, but I don't know if she'll take you up on the offer, but here's what I will say. And as this is something I think everybody could really truly value when I brought up the idea of her being on the show well actually when I told her it was your idea to bring her to the show her first thought was I don't even know what I would talk about and what ultimately came out was she spoke about something that she's really passionate about and I think that we all have something we're really passionate about so if you're ever concern or hesitant or thank you it's like you said before some people think that they're not creative we all just have to dig dig into that creative muscle and use it we've all got something that we're passionate about so talk to passion talk yeah. to passion yeah, yeah. totally yeah. and that's what our show's about right we have people on our show that are talking about something they're passionate about yeah oh man we've learned so much um ian talking about community John talking about, you know, that asset-based thinking. Mario talking about the diversity of creativity. John talking about doing terrible ideas because they're not so terrible. And Dan talking about bringing out the, the, you know, 
taking that individual uh, individually out uh, indiv I can't even say the word Kathy I know, individuality I <laughs> out of public speaking but more so Fight Club and and Jimbo talking about thinking outside of the box to change the world and Steve talking about the future of AI and Trevor talking about the accountability of opportunity and Yassine talking about career capital and the M shaped people and Lauren talking about the importance of diversity. This has been an awesome season eight, but I got to tell you, get ready, get ready. Not only just get ready for season nine, but you, Kathy, get ready for me to say what I always say all the time. I am so thankful and so grateful, so appreciative to be on this journey with you, my sister. Um, I couldn't imagine doing this with anybody else. So thank you for who you are and what you pour into me. Oh, thank you, Mark. Same, I cannot imagine, I can't imagine life without Mark Williams in it. Let's start there. And then <laughs> doing this, nah, I can't, I can't imagine another single person in the world. You are the best, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Well, listen, this is an amazing journey to do this. It's about to go down. Show we continue to look for more people to have these amazing conversations with. So for anybody out there who's got an idea that you'd love to talk about it, you love to just kind of massage and figure out how you can get it out to the world, reach out to us at It's About to Go Down Show. Mark and Kathy, we'd love to have this conversation with you. We're ready to build on another 81 people. But first, we'll start with the next 10 with season nine. So stay tuned for season nine of It's About to Go Down. Thank you for joining us for the first eight seasons of It's About to Go Down. And we look forward to having another conversation with you and many on the next episode of It's About wow. to Go Down. And that's a wrap. That's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>